last year or so, what would you be telling that guy who was probably questioning, like, why am I doing this for? Uh, many periods of questioning that, but it all comes down to, like, this is a gift I have, and this is where I believe I'm going to be, like, in the sport. Yeah. It'd be a waste not to use it. Very warm welcome to the video, guys. Today we are talking about the news, which is, you know, really flooding the triathlon community uh, as of late, which is Colin Cartier, positive for EPO and suspended for three years. Now, I want to take this opportunity just to talk more so on the actual effects of performance enhancing drugs, specifically EPO, which Colin was busted for. And one, obviously we can, you know, uh, extrapolate on or talk about the idea of how immoral, if every single person in the, the field is clean, how immoral that, you know, his use of EPO is, and therefore if everyone's clean and he's using performance enhancing drugs, he's getting such a big advantage, of course. However, there's often this argument and specifically, you know, if we go all the way back to the Lance Armstrong era where, you know, you can put a percentage on it, 50%, 40%, 80%, 90%, maybe, who knows? It's very difficult to know of the Peloton was using EPO or some form of performance enhancing drugs. So therefore comes the argument, well, if every athlete's on performance enhancing drugs as a hypothetical, therefore it's a level playing field. And that's not necessarily the case. And we'll go into that exactly why. Now, just to preface this, obviously we don't know how many athletes in triathlon are doping. You know, if there's one that goes positive in my mind, I'm quite skeptical. I think, well, you know, people don't just do this alone. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we have seen some incredible performances and I don't want to draw any speculation unfounded, but you know, it's professional sports and there still is big money at, at the top, certainly nowhere near the ranks of other sports and certainly not in, you know, you need to really be winning races or coming top 10 or top five, even podiuming in races to be actually making a career from this. However, that being said, you know, there is always going to be a temptation when there's money and fame involved for athletes to cross that line into the realm of performance and anything drugs. And this is professional sports and I'm not naive to that fact. So let's look at the actual measurements or determinants or what's called the, like the morphological components that go into actual athletic capacity and athletic or endurance ability. Now this little um, diagram that we've got here on the left is taken from a 2008 article um, in the or from the journal of physiology and it's titled endurance exercise performance the physiology of champions basically obviously there's a lot more to this it's very complex there are even things now i've read up on some articles from 2020 2023 even we still don't know every single thing or all like every incy bit of minutia that goes into the human body that makes the champion but these are some of the big things that are measurable so looking at the bottom row there we have muscle capillary density you know the actual capillaries which distribute blood from the circulation into the muscles and reabsorb out of the muscles in order to deliver oxygen and take oxygen back away to the heart to the lungs to get reoxygenated the muscle capillary density so obviously the more dense the capillaries in are in and around the muscles that you want to be really um you know performing at a high level with that's going to improve performance next thing is stroke volume how much can the blood actually sorry can the heart actually pump how much blood can it pump for every beat so the stroke volume is how much volume of blood the heart itself can pump per beat evidently if you can pump more blood per beat and get more blood out with every single heartbeat you're going to be able to you know get more blood into the system to the muscles to deliver oxygen the next thing is maximum heart rate it's pretty self-explanatory I would say it's not a huge component of very high level endurance trained athletes. Um, you know, we have some athletes that have very low maximum heart rates, like for example, on Sanders, other athletes that will have higher max heart rates, but it does come into it. Hemoglobin content. And this is where EPO comes into the picture because hemoglobin is the actual protein, which carries, which is contained within red blood cells themselves, which is responsible for the transport of oxygen around the body. So when we breathe oxygen in or air into the lungs, we have oxygen diffusing into the our pulmonary system and we are having diffusion of oxygen it's basically getting picked up by the hemoglobin component or the protein on those red blood cells going back to the heart pumped around the body delivering that uh, oxygen to the muscles and then taking on carbon dioxide blowing that off at the lungs you know i'm not going to make this a whole physiology lesson 
Um, but you know, you get the picture and hemoglobin is responsible for carrying oxygen around, delivering it to the tissues themselves. So very important. Uh, aerobic enzyme activity. This is really relating to mitochondria. You know, mitochondria are the year 12 biology powerhouse of the cells. What does that mean? Well, essentially the more mitochondria you have, the more efficient you are going to be at producing energy in the form of what's called ATP, but producing energy basically for the muscles to use. And there's a whole bunch of processes and enzymatic cascades involved in that. So, you know, the more mitochondria, the more efficient you are at producing energy, the more enzymes you have that are working towards doing that, that's going to improve um, aerobic performance. The next one is distribution of power. And this is where it kind of, you know, tails off into where we have performance or VO2, so aerobic performance, and then performance O2 deficit, which is anaerobic performance, essentially how much of our power is being produced through the aerobic system versus the anaerobic system. And if you can shift that, you know, if you're putting out 300 Watts, but you're overproducing lactic acid and hydrogen ions and fatiguing because you're using too much anaerobic, uh, you know, physiology, then you're going to tire out and not be able to hold that for very long. But if you can be, you know, trained or have better genetics and you can produce 300 Watts, you know, predominantly through the aerobic system, then of course, you're going to be able to sustain that for a longer time. Um, so all of these things looking at the aerobic system really work on maximum oxygen consumption, how much oxygen can we take in and utilize, and then lactic threshold or VO2. So how well can we uh, operate at a high level of lactic acid and you know how well can we utilize the molecules of oxygen that we are getting in to produce energy through the aerobic system. The other things that contribute to it are our gross mechanical efficiency. So these are things which are really pre-genetically determined. You can train to a little bit of an extent your percentage of slow twitch type 1 muscle fibers versus your type 2 A and B uh, fast twitch, which are more involved uh, in the explosive power generation, you know, uh, sprinting, weightlifting, etc. However, if you have a high, a high, I can't even speak now, if you have a higher proportion of slow twitch muscle fibers, you are evidently going to be able to, you know, you're going to be able to, you're going to be more efficient in the endurance activities as opposed to, and you're probably going to have a reduced ability to actually sprint and produce high levels of explosive power. So that distribution or percentage distribution in the muscles is predetermined and potentially to a little bit, you can train that. Um, anthro, um, what's the next one we've got? Anthro, uh, podometry this is basically just like your biomechanics, the actual structure of your body, you know, your bone length, yeah, tendon elasticity, all that kind of stuff, really predetermined. Obviously you can stretch and, you know, do all that kind of stuff, but really your biomechanics are predetermined. So long story short, you can see, and you get the picture, there are a lot of things that go into generating a high level of, um, or, you know, that really make up a good endurance athlete. And there are more things than this alone. These are just the kind of big overarching ones that we really focus in on. So hemoglobin content is just one of them. But why is EPO such a heavily used performance enhancing drug? Well, the main reason is that most of these things, you know, for example, the cardiac changes and stroke volume, heart rate, et cetera, these can be trained to an extent, but not really improved necessarily with drugs. You know, if you have drug induced heart enlargement, that's probably going to be a bad thing. So really the only things that we can change and the only things that aren't purely genetically determined, um, well, these are all genetically determined but the one thing we can really modulate is the hematocrit or hemoglobin content and this can be done through epo now why is this a problem in terms of creating an unlevel playing field well think about it like this if you have two athletes and they can both do an eight hour ironman um purely natural just through their genetic makeup you know you may have one athlete that is uh, exceptional at substrate utilization, getting oxygen into the muscles, but doesn't necessarily have a very high hematocrit and hemoglobin content naturally. They may sit at a hematocrit of 40%, for example. That's 40% red blood cells contained within your circulation. You know, they may just be more efficient at using the oxygen as opposed to someone else who can also do a eight hour Ironman. However, they naturally have a hematocrit that sits at 50, for example, 50% hematocrit. So 50% red blood cells in the circulation. Now, if you put both of those two, you know, athletes who have the same performance at their peak genetic capacity, there is very little room to modulate the athlete who naturally sits at 50% hematocrit than, than the athlete who sits at only 
they can go up 10% and still sit within that, you know, threshold of having that, whether it's the, the wider threshold or UCI threshold or whatever you want to call it, of 50% hematocrit. However, the guy that's already got a high hematocrit doesn't really have much room to, to, to move. Now, of course, they would still benefit from EPO. It's going to enhance most endurance athletes' performance, of course, because what does it mean? It means you can train harder, train longer, recover better. Because when you're training a lot and when you're doing a lot of uh, strenuous endurance activity, you're essentially going to develop what's called sports-induced anemia where your hematocrit drops because you're really burning through the red blood cells um, if you're not allowing sufficient recovery. So the EPO will allow the 50% natural hematocrit guy to stay there and not drop down and burn out. However, they're really already at that ceiling in, in terms of their acute performance uh, enhancement potential. Whereas the 40% guy, remember these two guys are on the same level genetically, naturally, but the 40% hematocrit dude is going to have a much higher threshold for improvement through the same drug. So this is why the argument that, you know, everyone's doping, therefore it's a level playing field anyway. Well, not really, because the drugs allow different levels of performance modulation determine pre which are predetermined really by drug response, how well you react to it, do you have side effects, can do you tolerate it well, etc. And then, you know, along these performance metrics, what can you really adjust or where can you go up in? And two athletes of the same natural genetic capacity may have completely different variations of that, if that makes sense. It's a bit of a complicated thing and I haven't really explained it all that well. However, that's really the general gist of it is that two athletes both at the same genetic, you know, both at their peak performance genetically, eight hour Ironman. However, EPO may significantly enhance one guy's performance over the other. Now, obviously, and we talked about drug response, some people will take, for example, you know, if you've read Tyler Hampton's book, he tried human growth hormone, it made it feel like crap, bloated, swollen, um, puffy, didn't respond well. Other athletes may take it and it may help a lot. So that's why, you know, individual drug response is gonna matter. Um, some of the side effects that some athletes, well, sorry, you know, no one should be taking EPO without a medical uh, indication, of course. Um, but, you know, taking EPO can cause pretty severe headaches. It can cause um, a, raise, a rise in blood pressure. It can cause anxiety, tachycardia, ele elevated heart rate in some people, um, and a whole bunch of other problems. Increase the risk of small, uh, like microstrokes in the brain, increase the risk of pulmonary embolism via deep vein thrombosis, blood clotting, etc. Um, and you know, people have died, athletes have died from taking too much of this stuff, uh, in the past. So super dangerous and not something that an athlete should ever do at all. But of course, without being naive, there are athletes that do it. Obviously we're going to assume they're doing it in conjunction with a very dodgy doctor, but at least with a doctor that's overlooking their markers, um, and isn't going to run them into too much, uh, or it can at least mitigate some of the risk and not go into too dangerous territory. So. You know, what else is there to add to this? I guess the main things are, there are many things that go into natural performance. It's never a level playing field because everyone's genetic, genetics are different. But if you look at sport from a pure perspective, if everyone's natural, at least that's what they're born with, that's what they're capable of. When you add drugs into the mix, particularly something like, something like EPO, the potential for that to improve one athlete over the other in terms of the actual benefit gain can be large depending on where your baseline is. Even if you're already like, capable of the same performance as another guy, another guy might get more of a benefit from it. So that's where it kind of, you know, gets a bit murky and tricky. Um, and that argument does kind of fold, fold away a bit. At the end of the day, you know, sports are high level entertainment, sports, athletes make money when they win, they get sponsors when they win. Um, Colin Chartier had some, you know, incredible performances last year, winning the US Open. $100,000 paycheck, many sponsors came on board. He also won another Ironman, can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, one from Blonde actually. Um, and, you know, the temptation will always be there for athletes to do this. Of course, many risks involved, very dangerous. This drug was originally designed for patients who are in renal failure, so kidney failure, who have chronic kidney disease. Why is that? Well, basically, the kidneys are actually responsible for making EPO naturally. And if you have kidney disease, you become anemic because your kidneys aren't making EPO as they should. So you administer that for patients with chronic kidney disease and you prevent them from becoming anemic or you treat an anemia, which has resulted. Um, of course, though, there is the potential for abuse in performance uh, or sports performance. And something like EPO will certainly give high level endurance athletes a significant advantage. But keep in mind, even if two guys are on the same playing field, 
depending on where the natural hemoglobin and hematocrit sit, it may give one athlete much more of an advantage than another. So always something to keep in the back of your mind, even if you are of the assumption, well, they're all doping anyway, who cares? One guy got caught, tell us what is. Well, you know, it's still not, it's still kind of creating that unlevel or that unfair advantage for the athlete where it doesn't really help. That said, do I think all these, <clears throat> excuse me, do I think all these high level performance uh, Ironman athletes, triathletes are doping? Absolutely not. Do I think you can be a professional triathlete clean? Absolutely. Um, however, you know, it's very, uh, it's been a shock to the triathlon community. And what's really surprised me is the rate at which these other professionals have come out and just slammed Colin for what he's done. You know, if this was cycling, particularly 10, 20 years ago cycling, none of the other cyclists would be talking. It would just be lips closed, zip it up, don't say anything. One of our guys has gone down. They're not going to speak, push it to the side. What will come of this? Will Colin talk about it? Will he expose or at least, you know, give us more details about how he did it? Um, will he implicate other athletes, other coaches? We can lead them even. You know, it doesn't look great, but obviously <clears throat> by no means does him being positive automatically implicate someone else. By no means. Um, but it will just be very interesting to see what comes of this. And yeah, that's the story. So what I wanted to do here, obviously, just a bit of an overview as to why what APO is, you know, why it helps endurance athletes, why it will always probably be a problem and well, most likely remain a problem until testing improves. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, ultimately why, you know, um, it even if all athletes had access to this stuff, which they don't, but even if they did, it still does create those discrepancies in overall benefits. So hope you guys enjoyed that little physiology chat. Hope you stayed with me for it and post any questions, comments below. I'm not making any moral statements of you know, what Colin's done. I don't know the full story with regard to how much of this actually goes on in triathlon. We'd love to hope everyone was clean. Obviously everyone's not. So let me know what you guys think. Post any uh, personal opinions in the comments section. Any engagement is certainly appreciated. Take care everyone and I'll see you all in the next video.